Let's talk about Julian Batchelor. Now, Chewy, you know how careful I am with my my accusations and my words. They're way so more careful me, than me. For me to say someone is lying, right, a liar, then the evidence has to be pretty, pretty nailed down. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. True, true. It's quite interesting because we're hearing a lot of, um, there's obviously a lot of a discourse around the way that we have discourse now, yes. whether it be in five minute chunks on Channel One News or if it's, um, you know, public presentations where like in the States, for example, you're getting picketed by groups yep. of people that are just yelling you down. Yep. And so nothing constructive happens. No. The, the public intellectuals that we seem to have at the moment a lot of people are either they go oh it's almost into hero worship of everything this person says is fantastic oh, okay yes to either, i haven't encountered that luke but oh, carry on yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, yes. to the opposite side of the whole idea of like a public intellectual is a bit uh what's the word superficial perhaps mm -hmm. and and there's some truth to that because i mean i do a lot of media i mean i would do two or three interviews of some sort in a week and they mm. might be on breakfast television or it might be radio new zealand so i have a regular slot on Catherine ryan or um recently it's been with the print media oh yes and and there's so short and long formats as you well know mm. and so Catherine ryan is great because for 20 minutes you get to talk about i talk about demography so you get to talk about demography mm. so you can explore an issue reasonably well in 20 minutes but when you appear on some other formats, first of all, um, you will have agreed with a producer that this is what you talk about. And True. by the time you get there, it might be quite different. So mm. that's, that's always a bit of a challenge. <laughs> but the other thing is that you've got to summarise what you need to say in two or three sentences. Yeah. And first of all, I, I'm not sure that many academics really can do that very well. They want to, they want to talk about the methodology and they want to talk about, you know, ifs, buts and maybes. Yeah. And of course, the media are not interested in that. So you, you, you do come across as being somewhat superficial because you've got to be, you, you, you've got to be able to communicate something which doesn't really do justice to the work and the evidence and the research that you've done. Yeah. We should look at the number of people granted permanent resident visas. And here's what that looks like over the last 10 years. Pretty much 45,000 people coming to live in New Zealand every single year. That's roughly 1% of the population. How did we arrive at the 1% target? It's something that we share with Australia and Canada. It's 1% of population. And is there some rationale for that? Or is it just, well, oh, they're doing no, it, so it seems it like a good idea. It's so. a good idea. They've done it, and I think we should do it. But why do we need this 1% at all? Essentially, we're ageing with nobody to help provide labour in the society. It's a question that I always ask, who's going to wipe your chin? So one of the things that's going to happen over the next decade is the numbers over the age of 65 are going to double, and we've got things like a dependency ratio. Now, when I was growing up in 20th century New Zealand, the dependency ratio was four people in paid work to one dependent. Currently, we're heading towards a two to one ratio. Two to one? Yes. So we've got to balance that out. And the way that we're doing that is by encouraging immigrants who are going to contribute economically to the country. If we want to keep getting superannuation in the future, some experts think part of the solution means letting even more tax-paying immigrants into the country. But will they be contributing enough? What I'm talking about here is, to me, it's time to start joining the dots. You know, we do have to understand what is going on out there. The big whether we should be a big country or a small country, and I've got some um, numbers here in a minute, will um, help you understand that, is not being helpful. Um, population ageing, as, as one of my colleagues in Australia called it, uh, an inconvenient truth. And it ha because people are sort of slowly engaging with the idea, first, you know, there's going to be more elderly, or they get the idea that people having fewer children mean that the larger proport that the larger numbers of old population also become a larger proportion. But they don't take the next step and go, well, what happens when you have more elderly than children? Well, it's about 10 years once you have more elderly than children to having more deaths than births. And it's a situation that we haven't encountered before. But we, Waitaki is already encountering that here. 
Um, most important thing is that this region here is going to grow. It's going to grow quite significantly still, not nearly as much as Auckland, but it's nearly all um, at the older ages. Aging driven growth is completely different to youth driven growth and it has huge implications for what you do. Okay, so I want to start with this um, New Zealand uh, Institute of Economic Research's suggestion that New Zealand should have a population of um, 15 million by 2061, because this is the argument that people keep coming back to me with. Okay, so if we were to assume that the birth rate, 2.1 births per woman, is what you need to replace the population, if that remained constant, we push life expectancy at birth up to 95 years, and that stats New Zealand's highest assumption, and we give it for both males and females. We increase annual net migration um, to 100,000 a year. Normally it's around about, well, the medium variant is about 12,000 a year. Um, if we keep the age structure of migrants very youthful, notwithstanding what I just said about the fact that we'll be competing on a diminishing pool and migration positive at all ages, mm -hmm. so that instead of what we usually do is we lose young people and we gain people at ever so slightly older, uh, like middle ages, um, we keep it positive at all ages, our 2061 population would be 10.8 million and 22% would be over the age of 65. So it's really bigger population, not much difference in terms of the actual ageing. And if you happen to read the NZIER report, they point out right through it the impossibility of achieving the, um, I, the p possible target population of, of 15 million. So it's really important that you understand those things because the debate, and I keep getting calls from the media about it, it's not about whether it's achievable, it's about where should they live? You know, what will they be like? Who will they be? <laughs> you know, how are we going to manage this big population? And it's impossible. So it's much more important that we engage with <laughs> the realities that we're dealing with, and that is the fact that there will be growth, but most of that growth will be at the older ages. If, you, if we wanted to get that 15 million population by 2061, and I tried various runs on my, uh, with my software, uh, we'd want 150,000 net migrants a year. We'd have to keep the, the fertility rate at 2.1. <coughs> New Zealand, as I'll say again in a minute, already has the highest birth rate in the developed world, so we would really be pushing it. Um, or we'd need the birth rate to get back up to baby boom levels, about 3.5 <laughs> births per woman, uh, and keep it you know, a, a, a more achievable 100,000 migrants a year. So you see the difficulty. It's really not possible. And it's not possible because of these inconvenient truths about population ageing. The reason I think uh, this is a nice analogy with Brexit is that high immigration is uh, a point of elite bipartisan consensus, just as the uh, relations with the EU were in the UK. Okay? So this was a point of elite consensus which was never tested really with the population. So both major parties in the UK took it for granted that Britain's you know, slow halting but gradual enmeshment with Europe was a good thing. Uh, and it seems to me because these parties became so disconnected from the public in the way that I just described earlier, mm. they failed to recognise that the public had not bought into this sentiment. Now, it's not that the public was against it necessarily. They just, they just hadn't paid any attention to it and they certainly weren't invested in it the way that the political class was in, uh, in the UK. So when they did eventually make the mistake of asking, the British people came back with the wrong answer. Joey and I might stick around and if people want to get a hold of us or call us, I quote unquote call us on Discord, we might take some, but Paul is not going to be involved in that at all. Uh, because to be honest, and those of you who watch us and have heard the conversations we've had with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Byron Clarks of the world and that, um, you know, Paula, you're, you're not getting particularly good response from sectors of the public right now. And we're not going to expose Paula to that. Let's just be blunt. We're not, we're not going to do that. So if you Thank want to you. come on Discord and you want to potentially interact with me and Chewy, that might, and I'll say might happen at the end, you know, depending it's Friday night, we might be tired and want to go anyway. But we'll, but we're saying if you want to go to Discord, there's the link, jump on, listen to us there as well, and that might turn into a conversation later on. Anyway, I think that's it. Is there anything else, Chewy, about setting up how we're running tonight? 
No, I, I think just as far as the chat, I don't mind dissenting voices. Just have respect for the other people in the chat and our guests and ourselves, and we'll be golden. Yeah, cool, man. Hey, uh, Paula, you said at the start of the documentary when you were talking about would should you guys even do this? You know, because this is some would say platforming these views. You know that old saying. And you said, and I'm sorry, I'm looking off to the side because all my notes are up here on this big 50 inch screen. Um, mm -hmm. You said about. Uh, you said about um, you were getting advice, stuff followed advice on how to report this. I was wondering advice from who? Heaps of people, um, heaps of uh, guidelines, written resources for journalists internationally particularly, but also from some amazing uh, uh, resources and people and groups who helped us within New Zealand about the work that they've done in this field who, who know these people, uh, uh, helped us. Uh, compiled a set of resources uh, and so we went through them line by line. The one the one that um, has had probably the most international exposure is the data and society report called Oxygen of Amplification which um, was which is an incredible body of work actually for anyone not just journalists. The point of it is to help journalists work through reporting dangerous speech. But right. it's an interesting read for anyone who's interested in what happened around Trump and how the media got that wrong. And it's lessons that have been um, written down now for, uh, for journalists internationally about what not to do and also what to do. And so we, we followed that script very, very closely about mm -hmm. uh, how to not platform and how to put things in context and it helped us make some quite unusual editorial decisions about how we would make this documentary. I want to I want to con, uh, contrast Raf's point of view with the other like legitimate politi politicians that have stooped to go on the platform. Totally. I I, like, I actually think literally I actually, stooped. I, I actually think, and I've been I, I, I've been talking to Raf today. I mean, I've been messaging with him, and I've asked him to come on, and he said he said he'd come on and have a chat with us, Jay. Isn't that funny? Um, I'm sure that'll get up Plunkett's cloaca. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh. I, I don't know why I said cloaca. It just felt so right at the moment, and now I feel so oh, I, so dirty. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like thinking of Sean Plunkett having a, a multi-use orifice. And look. What Caitlin has said is actually is actually what I'm what I'm saying now as well. Yeah, I actually think we're we're in the, and this is what I've said to Rafe on the messaging today. It's like I actually think this is an ethical stance by someone who could do yeah. what Plunkett, uh, sorry, what Luxon does, or could do what um, Seymour does. And have to figure out not so much Seymour because he's pretty out there, but what Luxon does, and have to try and find that line, Luxon's dilemma, about how to get the 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 white supremacists, racist, misogynists, you know, ugly, ugly people to vote for you, whilst not in not uh whilst not endorsing their views publicly, dog whistle to them, give policy that they like, but but don't acknowledge them. That's what National has to do. Whereas, I think it's principled, of top, to go you're repugnant now i'm paraphrasing you're repugnant oh no i, I want nothing that. i want nothing to do with you you are unethical you are disgusting you know to just be grossly generalistic you could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. 